This is Dreams for Midsummer. Uh, so those of you in the audience who won't be aware of how this evening's event has come about, uh, the Lit Fest has previously published images of uh, poetry and short fiction by local writers as a result of three creative writing competitions that we've held. 2018, 2020, and earlier this year. Uh, so this event, rather than throwing open a whole writing competition, uh, because we wanted to do something the midsummer, but the time wasn't available to, to set an entire competition in motion, what we did was to invite the people that have contributed to the previous anthologies to submit a piece on a specific theme. And we have selected our favorites of those for you to hear this evening. Uh, I will put in the chat later on. We've also produced all of the texts of tonight's poems and short stories as a downloadable PDF booklet. So if you want to reread the people's work uh, at your own pace after the event, you'll have the link to go and get, a, get yourself a copy of that. That won't otherwise be generally available. This is a thank you to our readers and a, a special gift for those of you that have booked a ticket to, to come along and hear them. Um, I take it everybody is pretty familiar with the general workings of Zoom, so I'm not going intending to spend too much time doing a work through on that. If while the poets and short story writers are speaking, you could stay muted, that would be appreciated and polite. Uh, readers, uh, when I introduce you, I will introduce you using the biographies that you've kindly provided for the booklet that's available. Uh, while I'm doing that, please unmute yourself and then read your piece. Uh, and everybody else, your comments and thanks and applause and appreciation will be very welcome in the chat window. Uh, if we have time left at the end of the event, certainly we can organise a decent round of applause. Or if you have any questions for any of the authors that they're happy to take, you can do that. Uh, on that note, I think we should begin. Um, I'm going to start by reading something by somebody not here uh, and not Shakespeare either, despite the whole Midsummer Night's Dream theme. We looked around for pieces that we thought were a suitable introduction for our theme of a dream of Midsummer. And we settled on a poem by the Scottish poet Edward Morgan called Strawberries. There were never strawberries like the ones we had that sultry afternoon, sitting on the step of the open French window facing each other, your knees held in mine, the blue plates in our laps, the strawberries glistening in the hot sunlight. We dipped them in sugar, looking at each other, not hurrying the feast for one to come. The empty plates laid on the stone together with the two forks crossed, and I bent towards you, sweet in that air in my arms, abandoned like a child from your eager mouth, the taste of strawberries. In my memory, lean back again, let me love you. Let the sun beat on our forgetfulness. One hour of all the heat intense and summer lightning in the Kilpatrick Hills. Let the storm wash the plates. So, having set the mood with a bit of Edwin. Oh, sorry. <laughs> let me introduce the first of our readers this evening. Uh, oh, wow. Mr. So T. Williams. Uh, so originally from the forest of Dean in Gloucestershire, and moved to Milton Keynes in 2010, where she now lives with her husband and two guinea pigs. She enjoys the challenge of communicating her internal goings on through poetry and painting. She has a PhD in planetary sciences and loves the outdoors. So please welcome Felicity Williams. Thank you. <laughs> the Sun Appreciation Planet. Delighted to have found you. We're admirers of sunbeams, you see. We bid in chlorophyll and melanin, raise in sugars, in vitamin D, even pixels and computer clouds. We want to see the real you, how our breath brings you blue, how our water washes rainbow out of you. We put you through it, it's true. Without us, you are endless starlight piercing through the void. Without you, we are crumbs on cold plates. So grateful to collaborate. 
our biome goosebumps at your touch pursues in barrens of blooms your seasons traced with stippling pops and pings of pinks and greens as buds outstretch for you unveiled for chaste cheek strokes from you then blush a berry debauchery in pasto plum and raspberry an artist with a view and such a view needs materials too on this your longest residence i dream a brimming palette and large canvases for you stakeholders see what you can do thank you felicity and for starting us off with a with a poem about sunshine um, always welcome on a midsummer uh, and nice to have a little back today uh, I'm recently back from France, where we had rather too much of it, uh, but I'm becoming a sun appreciator bit by bit. Um, our second reader this evening is Sue Reed. Sue was once an accountant and then gained a PhD in English literature and became a freelance writer and editor. Her first non-fiction book is D.H. Lawrence, Music and Modernism, published in 2019. She's now writing her first novel. Sue, welcome to MK Lit Fest. Thank you. Dandelion clocks. Away with the fairies, mother would say, to the slightest flight of fancy. I was a fanciful child, so usually she was talking about me. It took a while to realise she meant this unkindly. In a house with three sisters who learned quickly to please a mother who disbelieved in fairies, there was nowhere to hide. I fled to the garden where fairies lived in the dandelion clocks. I puffed their ethereal fluff skyward before father could mow them down. How will we get rid of them if you blow the seeds everywhere, he yelled, giving new meaning to away with the fairies. Perhaps my parents wished me away too. I ran away in my head, making up stories until my teacher told me to stop. On the final exam was a list of composition topics, and one was always a story. Write about the weather or the contents of your pencil case or anything, my teacher had warned, but don't write a story. Why was it there if you weren't supposed to choose it? I stared at my pencil case for half an hour, then wrote a story. She would never know. I did well enough to run away for good, First to a red brick university in the north, then to a grey office on Midsummer Boulevard. I progressed from trainee to supervisor to manager to senior manager to director. My boss was my fairy godfather until one day he wasn't. We can't promote you anymore, he said. You don't have ingredient X. What, I asked, is ingredient X? We talked for ages, but it can't be defined. You just know if it's missing. Take the rest of the day off, he said, as though the diagnosis was terminal, which in a way it was. I collected Faye from nursery and she ran to me, the wings of her Tinkerbell costume fluttering. At home, I peeled off my power suit and we stretched out on the grass, blowing dandelion plumes into the clear blue sky until it grew darker, but never dark. It was, I realised, midsummer night. In the morning, mother phoned from her new home, where she has full-time carers now she can't care for herself. I wondered how she knew I was home on a work day, or whether she's forgotten about days of the week. I dreamed I was a fairy, mother said. How was it? I asked. Lovely like floating away with those dandelion clocks you used to love. Still do, I said. Faye and I blew some your way last night. Thank you, she said. You can go away with the fairies whenever you like, Mum. So can you, she said, and hung up. She's right, I laughed. My laptop purred its readiness and my fingers danced across its keys, spinning a dream of midsummer to send to my boss. And I never set foot in an office again. 
Lucy, thank you. And I, I do hope the parting shot there is a true story. Okay. Um, next reader for you this evening is Patrick Morehouse. Patrick is a 62 year old partially sighted stroke survivor. He's delighted every day to be alive, to enjoy the company of his beautiful wife and his giggling summer sorting grandchildren. He writes obsessively about things he can't view but see all around him when he is not looking. Welcome, Patrick. The Puka of Wolverton Hollow. In Wolverton Village, deep in a hollow, a Puka named Padmas met his fate. Lost on his way back from the old river ooze, he stumbled into this eerie place too late. The darkness embraced him, the hollow his tomb, his cries for help echoing in the air. But no one came to aid him, no light through the gloom, and Padmas was left to suffer in despair. Now, on midsummer night, his wails resound, a haunting melody that chills the soul for the puka's mischievous presence beyond control. Foolish Padmas haunts the hollow evermore, his fate a warning to all who would explore. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that with us, Patrick. Lovely to have you here. Thank you. <laughs> Our next reader for you this evening uh, uh, writes under the name J.B. Linkwater. We have him here as John Thin. Uh, J.B. Linkwater is an award-winning short story and flash fiction writer. He is also a published poet and occasional cartoonist. He's married with three daughters and has a dog. He likes to chew on the crunchiness of the human scape. And his place to think and write is a small shack by a beach along the rocky coast. Please take it away. Jasmine's ears. The rain came bang, just like that. And I reckon it would have drowned the duck. It was heavy, like really, really heavy. It was pushing cars down, like squashing them closer to the road. And the noise was like a zillion drummers gone crazy. And I reckon it would have drowned old ladies if they went out in it. And if it didn't drown them straight away, their shopping bags would have filled with water and pulled them down on their knees. And then it would have drowned them. My grandfather would have said it was calamitous. He was always using old fashioned words like that. Honestly, you wouldn't believe it. This was midsummer. I should have been wearing my shorts and flip-flops and been out flirting with Jasmine down by the river and disporting, another grandfather word, myself all over town and having a beer and having my shirt open. But here I am on my own with my nose shoved up against the window, dressed in my trackies and a thick jersey, watching the world being destroyed by a squillion trillion raindrops and seeing the gutters with actual waves in them. I shouted to my mum, Where's the bloody sun? And she told me to stop swearing and that it was up above the clouds. And I said, so let's fly to Spain. And she said, yeah, right. Who's paying? And I said, well, actually, we're all paying with this bloody rain for our folly with the natural world. And she said, folly, you sound like your grandfather. So I went up to my room and got out my pad and my favorite biro of Nick from the bank. And I wrote, I dream of summer. Then I crossed that out because I couldn't dream of anything with this petulant rain smashing down on the roof tiles. So I wrote down a dream for midsummer. Then I thought, whatever I write, I can read to Jasmine, maybe in the winter or something. But then I thought that wouldn't make sense because it was a dream for midsummer, a dream to be used specifically during midsummer. And then I thought about Jasmine's ears, which are cute. And then I thought about finding my shorts in case the sun ever came out. And then I wrote, a dream for midsummer should only be used at midsummer and therefore should be about snow and stuff 
because sometimes midsummer gets too hot. And then I thought, I wonder if Jasmine would like some sparkly earrings. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you so much for that one. Uh, an antipodean take on midsummer too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next this evening is Pippa Marshall. Uh, Pippa is a writer and artist based in Milton Keynes. She holds an MA with distinction, having studied English literature and creative writing with the Open University. Her poetry is published in Disability Arts Online, and she was shortlisted for the MEEC 2023 writing competition, Green Spaces in the City. Welcome back, Pippa, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Three Midsummer Haiku. Boulevards of years, crossing and recrossing paths, in wandering youth, to suddenly find in the noontide of our years only a short night. Over years we drift closer to the horizon, close at last to home. Thank you, Pippa. Thank you. As you can see, we're, we're alternating uh, poetry and prose for you this evening. Uh, to keep things fresh as we go through. Uh, so our next reader is another <laughs> short story writer. Uh, Ruth McCracken, although born and raised in Ulster, has lived and worked for almost 40 years in Milton Keynes. She hopes to tell great stories well and has been fortunate to have several published in various anthologies. She's currently working on a novel. You can find Ruth on Instagram as rmccwriting uh, and you can find her right here now actually reading for you in person. Welcome <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dave, and hello to everyone. It's lovely to see you all. The longest time. Midsummer's day, interminable. Hours and hours of light, stretched with some kissed possibility. Blessed with an unremembering of the bitter winter's darkness. My birthday though I know little about the day I was born. Also, the journey here. I imagined rattling past field after field, flashing through Victorian stations with blurs for names, but find myself on a local train, counting blades of grass. Gradually, ruminant cows turn to concrete, and the train and my heart lurched to a standstill. From the platform, my feet followed Google's blue line to my destination while I wondered what to expect. I had sidestepped protocols, taken advantage of an agency worker distracted by an urgent call from her son's school to lean over and memorize an address. The bell's buzz fell silent. No one at home, or no one wanting to let me in. Then the door opened and there he was, about 10 years younger than me, bare chested and footed, a hairy stomach flabbing over sports shorts, Celtic knots tattooed down one arm, ears heavily studded, scruffy beard, shaven head, lager in hand. His eyes, blue as the summer sky, scanned the rows of red brick terraced houses. Someone was having a barbecue. Kids were squabbling. A few streets away, the tinny tempting tinkle of an ice cream van. But none of these gave him an answer. So he drank from his can and studied me. I became acutely aware of the crisp cotton covering me from head to toe, protecting my pale skin from burning. I shouldn't have come. Sorry, <clears throat> wrong. He startled me by reaching out and grabbing my hand, pulling me into the narrow hallway. I jumped as the door slammed behind me, tried to dig in my heels, but he had momentum. He was talking 19 to the dozen, dragging me through to the back. Did I want to drink? She'd always hoped I'd turned up, but not like 
And this on the ninth. If he'd known, he'd have beat the lemon drizzle. The garden swirled with colour and bees. At the bottom, a woman in a wide brimmed hat, shirt sleeves buttoned down, collar turned up, trousers tucked into walking boots, stabbed at a heap of something with a fork, tossing it into another bigger heap of something. A hard push in the back propelled me forward. I brushed against the sweetly scented jasmine climbing up towards the light, then faltered. I had anticipated this moment so often in so many ways. And now it was playing out in slow motion, someone else's story flickering on a small screen. I looked back at the loss. He was perching on the edge of a lounger, a tattered copy of Jane Eyre lay next to him. He was trembling. Mum, he yelled, she's here. My mother gasped and spun round as urgently as if he'd warned of a wasp swarm. We inched closer until we stood toe to toe. She touched my cheek tentatively, almost expecting me to vanish in a puff of smoke. Her palm was warm and smelt of brass. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I love that when we were, we were reading all the entries. And, uh, mm -hmm. Throughout, I had no real sense quite where it was going to wind up, which was really evolving, uh, captivating. Loved it. Thank you very much. Um, our next reader this evening is Stella Gervin. Stella has lived in Milton Keynes since the late 1980s. She has written poetry all her life, primarily to share with family and friends. So I hope that she's going to consider us friends this evening when she shares it with us. Stella, welcome. Thank you. This poem is called Pendulum. Ever since the equinox, we've built a midsummer dream. Each extra hour, the darkness swaps for one of lightness, added a theme, a theme of trees spattered now with white. Cherry and chestnut, elder and lime, airy blossoming unlocks the flowering of hedgerow in grassland, cascading like a stream of coloration through the city parks and verges, roadsides going right to Midsummer Boulevard, right and round and in the city's breathing heart. Package up a picnic, set up the barbecue, put beer in the icebox, call friends, and make a plan to meet, to gorge on strawberries and cream. Warmed in the sunshine, bright on the tongue, marinated in the long stretched evening light, dreaming of midsummer, drenched in color, relishing 15 hours of bright before the dark can start to shrink the day. Thank you. Thank you, Stella. Uh, you'll see uh, everybody in the chat window that I put a link to download the PDF book of this evening's plans and stories. I would very much recommend that you do that because you should actually see Stella's poem on the page. There's a, a visual element to this poem that you don't get just from the reading. <laughs> Here's one she prepared earlier. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Stella. Yeah. Uh, Reading for us next this evening is Claire Reed. Claire is a writer from Northamptonshire. She works in mental health. Uh, she was a finalist in Mink 2023, uh, was shortlisted in the MAHA short story competition in 2022, and has been published in online mystery journals. And we're very proud to have her here this evening. We yours, Claire. Thank you. The rocks were meticulously placed. Flat, smooth stones spiralling skywards into a towering cone. Joseph had never seen anything like it. Certainly not slap bang in midsummer place, obscuring the crowd pleasing frog bubble clock. Tall fellow, aren't you? He said, circling the cairn and pinching himself in case he was dreaming. 
How the hell did you get here? Joseph had worked as head of security at the shopping center for seven years, opening up, patrolling the boulevard in case of trouble and checking everything was neat and orderly. In all those years, he'd never discovered a massive monolith blocking his path. CCTV footage did not elucidate. Apart from a slight flicker at midnight, the cameras showed the center empty and quiet. Aliens, Joseph muttered, laughing anxiously to himself. That's all that explains it. He made several phone calls. Top was the shopping center management. He thought it was a prank until he sent photos. Then a demolition company he hoped would make a swift removal before customers forced to make detours on their shopping journeys made angry complaints. Along with several bemused cleaners, he placed cones around the perimeter and large and urgent signs telling people not to climb. Then he rang his wife, who he knew would be sipping her early morning cup of tea in bed, the cat at her feet. It's all on the radio, she said. You what? said Joseph, bemused. A pile of stones sprung up on each of the four roundabouts nearest the centre. By piles? How big are we talking? Well, a few feet. They've got nothing on this. When he returned to the spectacle, a crowd had formed. Retail assistants, coffee cups in hand, were stood, either gawping or taking photos. He overheard at least two trying to sell their stories to the Daily Mail. He attempted to shoo them on, but he wasn't their boss and had no jurisdiction. Bound to be druids on Midsummer's Day, he heard one of them say. Ancient ley lines, ain't it? I reckon it's Banksy. It's some sort of stunt anyway. Costly, was all Joseph could mutter. At 10 a.m., workmen arrived conspicuous in high vis, whistling through their teeth. Employees, early morning shoppers and crowds drawn by news reports were too fond to see it unceremoniously dismantled. Fearful of the mood turning and at management request, Joseph extracted an exorbitant quote and sent the men on their way. By the time his shift ended, despite the large fonted signs, the stones shone from people touching them, hoping for fertility, virility, good luck and prosperity. Three faith groups had arrived in robes and sung. A vicar had blessed it. The cairn was trending on social media platforms. Management contemplating taking ownership. The next morning, Joseph opened the centre, apprehensive at what he might find. More towers? An altar? A sacrifice? Instead, he found nothing, not even gravel on the shiny floor. Okay, thank you, Claire. Cl close encounters of the shopping mall find. <laughs> Thank you so much for reading it for me. Uh, next this evening, uh, we have Vanessa Horton. Vanessa is a regular on the local spoken word and literary festival circuit and is currently Buckingham Literary Festival's poet in residence. Um, I think you just missed Buckingham Lit Fest, but I hope it all went well. Uh, she is also a funeral celebrant and she hopes we, that we won't need her services anytime soon. I hope so too. Welcome, Vanessa, and please share your poem with us. Thank you, and good evening, everyone. Uh, this one is, uh, so I sent two serious poems in, and then I sent this one in as a bit of a joke, for, as an afterthought. Uh, but uh, obviously, it's the one you liked, uh, and it's called Midsummer Blues. Poets of yore with your dreams of midsummer, your wordscapes of summery hues, were none of you prone to hay fever and suffer the midsummer blues? As cloud lonely you wandered, seeking rhymes for Narcissi, did grass pollen not seem an issue? Did you need no relief from a cotton kerchief? They hadn't invented the tissue. You praised mighty oaks and house-high hay and bee-filled sun-drenched days. But did your pens not freeze as you started to sneeze with no recourse to Beckenay's sprays? Oh, to dream of midsummer like poets of old, but the pollen count drowns out my muse and leaves me with midsummer nightmares and feeling the midsummer blues. Thank you. 
Thank you, Vanessa. We we liked the serious poems too, but we've never heard a poem about hay fever and, and, and midsummer before. And you made us smile. So that's why we went with that one. <laughs> Thank you for reading for us. Uh, okay, some prose now that takes a rather darker turn. Uh, let us introduce Sam J.T. Butterworth. Sam is a managing editor and copywriter at ERA in Merton Keynes. He's also a fiction writer and former journalist with a steadily increasing line of dependence and a rapidly decreasing amount of free time. So we're glad that he spared some of it to join us this evening. Looking forward to hearing your story, Sam. Okay. This is called A New Reality. Let go of everything and know that you are creating a new reality simply by taking some time out for yourself today. The man's voice is gently soothing, familiar as an old friend. All thoughts of violence are gone. Settle back into your body and your environment, and when you're ready, open your eyes. I raise my eyelids slowly and take in this much needed new world, as if waking into a dream. I see the garden in monochrome blues at first, before my eyes adapt to the bright June light. But then come the real colours, the greens of the overlong grass and the canopy of the willow tree, whose fluffy catkins lie in its dappled shadow. The pinks of the self-seeded aquilegias, the pastel lilac of the remaining wisteria, and the red blooming in the flower bed. For now the smell is sweet and fresh. I hear bees, blackbirds and wood pigeons, and the distant clatter of a pheasant taking flight beyond the just cut field, the long grass felled to make hay while the sun shines. And it does, golden and divine from a powder blue sky, touched with wisps of white cloud like hasty paintbrush swipes. Could this actually be a new reality? I turn and look towards the flower bed, and what I see suggests otherwise. I pick up the phone from the glass top table, and the table wobbles on the unsteady surface of a deck Sarah's been banging on at me to replace. I told her there's an old septic tank down there, so I need to sort both things at once. But that was a while back. Was that the last straw? Or was it just him? It doesn't matter now. I look at the stats. 5,130 minutes meditated. 381 sessions. I put the phone face down on the table next to the hammer and sit back in the bistro chair I resprayed olive green. Not the colour Sarah would have chosen. The phone vibrates. His name appears and red shoots up within me like mercury in a thermometer. I snatch the phone and end the call. It buzzes again and I realise that I've flung it into a blue flowered hydrangea. The next time it rings, I pick up the hammer. I stand and my foot crashes through rotten timber, the rest giving way like breaking ice. The last of the garden I see before falling into darkness is Sarah's crooked, bloody corpse among mangled geraniums. I land on something hard. Then the smell hits me and I see the hammers puncture the tank and the pit is filling with vintage effluent. As the phone buzzes dully from the undergrowth above and the shit reaches my ankles, I decide that I don't like this new reality. But then I begin to laugh. What a place to hide a body. What a wonderful final line. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> a pleasure. Uh, our final poet for you this evening is Sarah Davis. Sarah is an exile from Merseyside, living down south. She's been writing on and off since she was six, and has been published in a range of poetry magazines. Uh, we're very pleased to say that our anthologies are just two of them. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you. The Mids. The boy in McDonald's with his school text, A Midsummer Night's Dream, gets to the part where someone's dad turns into an ass and laughs. Sprites attend him. He is peas blossom, cobweb, moth and mustard seed, drifting by on vape, vape smoke past five guys, and he hides away his book. There's Puck badly sprayed on the belly of the underpass. Drivers don't understand his name now. Folklore is folklore, if only for the people, and no imagined realm of ether. There is a place where the film broke down as we watched Midsummer. Remember, just after the first death, and we wandered down the fire exit to the theatre's sinister, the evening silent and a suspended notes of air, as you waited to resume the ritual, the night so warm. And this is a thought I have now, foot sore on a houseman boulevard, slightly drunk on sweetish apples, of the alignment of those streets with trees, 
no person tree higher than the elms, no city unless a city in the forest, Walker said, no person if not a tree whose blossom is green white, all litter and money and words, intoxicating with nothing but promise, like the boy MacDonald with the primer, dreaming and knowing the truth of summer. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, and an inadvertent fine film recommendation for the day along the way. Midsummer. <laughs> uh, I'm going to briefly hand over to Flora Reese now to introduce our final reader, as that would be me. So, Flora, if you'd like Thank to you. read my back. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. And I am delighted to introduce our final reader, Dave Wakeley. Uh, Dave has worked as a musician, a university administrator, a librarian, editor across Europe. His writing has been shortlisted for the Manchester Fiction and Bath Short Story Awards and appeared in numerous journals and anthologies. And in addition to that, he's an absolute stalwart of Milton Keynes Literary Festival. Dave, thank you. Thank you, Flora. This is uh, summertime in New Fordlandia. Uh, for those of you that don't get the reference, Fordlandia was a uh, new town that Henry Ford, the Ford Motor Company, attempted to build in Brazil. Uh, don't look it up on Wikipedia because the story is fascinating. Uh, summertime in New Fordland. Here in an estate on the town's fraying hem, ornamental cherry trees line the path to a children's playground like disappointed bridesmaids, their lacy frills weighed down by overnight rain. Beyond them, a recently jilted roundabout twirls the what dirty white train of its clapboard crinoline through a fringe of dandelions where discarded crisp packets uncurl cellulose petals as the day slowly warms. Watching on from one side like an uninvited aunt, a spreading rhododendron drapes itself against a rusty metal bench, blousy as a seaside landlady in an Edwardian resort where the tide went out some years ago. Everywhere else is angles and straight edges. Old Britannia's curves corseted into the modern planner's unremitting geometry. Graying slab clad starter homes where mono pitched roofs like robots in tin tray berets, where a giant steel star looms above on its grimy concrete pillar. Provincial England restyled as a fading Polaroid of East Berlin. Outside a nearby kitchen store, its half window curtained with cardboard cartons, a mother wails from a garden like a call to prayer June! June! Through a gap in the municipal brambles and dogwoods that thrive somehow, even on their diet of dog calls into view. G feet purposefully pedalling her plasticine pink tricycle, she cuts the groove across the grass, her wheels drawing parallel lines in the morning dew. I watch her giggles, giggles scatter in her wake like wildflower seeds, wondering how they'll ever germinate in such unpromising soil. Will her dreams find some vein of loam under this unyielding clay, here where so many women barely ripen before they start to spoil, hothoused by circumstance and vulnerable to every unexpected frost? How far from these stunted trees might she metaphorically fall, when so many spindly specimens have returned to earth so nearby? And is there a father too, lurking inside like a malignant tumour, ready with a curse and a slap? Or does an unobserved hand and heart still remember the promise of a new town, a new way, that even now, upstairs in the attic room, sketches her an escape route, still believing that today's destination can be tomorrow's starting point? Does a second-hand telescope point up from the skylight as he charts the stars and draws her horoscope, future triumphs strung between the constellations like pearls? Maybe he's standing at the kitchen sink, washing engine oil from crack-skinned hands before he makes marshmallows, ready to be roasted on their wonky garden barbecue as a midsummer midnight treat. As darkness returns, they might sit together in cautious cardigans under the climbing hydrangea, its flower head soft and pale as unpinked cotton. Maybe he'll wave his skewer at the heavens, drawing her eyes to the snow-white stars as he sings a few lines of Gershwin under his breath, exhaling the promise of summertime. Thank you. And that brings to an end our 12th and final reading for 
reading of our dreams for midsummer so i think you should all unmute yourselves and give all of our readers and writers uh, we can exclude me if i think uh, a, a well-deserved round of applause you've all been absolutely fantastic thank you so much <laughs>